Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Looking to the East. Really uh, grateful that uh, you're tuning in today. Uh, we're going to be talking about politics today. As you know, um, the United States has a new president, and he has been in his office now for just about 100 days. So I'm sure that uh, on the domestic side, uh, Think Tech is taking a look at how how President Biden has been doing over the last 100 days, but I wanted to do that as well, uh, but do it from an international perspective. <clears throat> so we have two very excellent guests that also uh, have a Kansai Gaidai connection. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Paul Scott, whom I've had on the show before, uh, talking about politics. Dr. Scott is a professor emeritus from Kansai Gaidai University, and as I recall, uh, Dr. Scott, you uh, studied at Virginia, University of Virginia, and also at Todai. And he currently resides in Paris, France. So I'm asking Paul, even though he is an American like the three of us, but as an expatriate living in Paris, to give a European perspective on how Biden has done in his first 100 days. So thank you very much, uh, Paul, for joining us today. Absolutely. And then... Yep. A second guest also has a Kansai Gaidai connection, is a Kansai Gaidai graduate. And uh, he has also been a guest on my show before. So we have some repeat visitors. There's going to be a special gift for both of you now that you've been on the show twice. Uh, it'll be in the <laughs> mail after the show is over. So Jiren sure. is, uh, as I mentioned, a Kansai Gaidai graduate and a long-term resident of Japan. Uh, he's a partner at Kitahama Partners, which is one of the major law firms in the Kansai area. And I've asked him to take up the perspective as an expat in Japan to take a look at how Biden has been doing over the last 100 days or so. So as with so many of my shows, it's triggered by articles that uh, I find or people send me uh, <clears throat> from the New York Times. And uh, just last week, there was an article uh, stating uh, Biden's popularity numbers, which uh, are quite incredible, and the fact that he seems to be supported not just by the moderate part of the Democratic Party, uh, which is, was a primary support for him in the election process, but also by the progressive part of the party as well. As a result, his popularity numbers are, uh, when he was elected, when he was, came into office, was 98%. And it's still in the 90s now for Democrats. Of course, it's lower for Republicans. But overall, his support from the country is in the 50% range. So let's talk about that at first. So guys, <clears throat> is, is this mostly or partly because we're all going through a decompression uh, of no Trump? Is a lot of Biden's support just the fact that he is not Trump and that we're all relieved that we have a new president? How much do you think that is a factor from, from your perspective? I'll start with you, uh, Paul, if you don't mind. Well, it's an interesting question. You know, America, Americans uh, have a new president, but they do not have a new country. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's important. Uh, we all know how many people voted uh, for Mr. Trump in 2020, almost 75 million people. And the uh, New York Times, um, uh, um, which used to be the paper on record, uh, is uh, is one of the victims actually, uh, or one of the casualties uh, of uh, of what we have to call Trumpism, and I agree with you completely that there's a great relief among uh, among members of the Democratic Party um, uh, uh, that Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump is gone and Mr. Biden. Uh, who was widely dismissed a year and a half ago, uh, is, now, is now president. Uh, on the Republican side, you're completely correct uh, that, um, that uh, the support is, is, uh, is not enthusiastic. Uh, and uh, since I've been invited to talk about, uh, about Europe, um, you know, for, for the Europeans, and we have to be careful because there's an old Europe and a new Europe, um, and I'll make that distinction maybe a little bit later. There's also great relief that, uh, that Mr. Trump is, is, not, uh, is not president, but to think that we're going to go back uh, to 2008 
um, which means the first year of the Obama administration or 2009 will be, uh, will be correct. Uh, and no one expects that. Uh, <clears throat> no one is expecting that uh, in Europe. So a little more, there's some, um, I think there's some, I may, maybe the view from Europe is, is more sober um, about the expectations of uh, American leadership uh, and to go back to uh, America uh, as a preeminent uh, power, a hyperpower, uh, if you if you like. So people are are waiting uh, to see. Uh, oh, really? Uh, yes, so yeah, still, it's still, still too early there. from a European perspective to well, make a call one way well, or the other. Yeah, you know, it's extremely interesting because um, um, I don't want people to start laughing at this. Uh, uh, you know, it's sort of sleepy Joe and, uh, you know, questions about his uh, mental acuity. But uh, the Financial Times just the other day uh, had an article about Mr. Biden calling him audacious and uh, talking about uh, what uh, Biden has done in his hundred days, uh, uh, which is basically uh, to um, not to destroy Reaganism, and we know Mr. Reagan was famous for saying that government is the problem, uh, and to have small government and uh, to, to cut uh, to cut budgets. And here, Mr. Biden is doing something that uh, some people are saying is just absolutely audacious. Uh, again, uh, by um, spending 1.9 trillion uh, for COVID relief, uh, which everyone, which most most I would think everyone in the U.S. is uh, is happy about, and and perhaps three trillion uh, in an infrastructure jobs um, creation program. Um, or my rough math would make that uh, five trillion dollars if both of these go through, instead of a type of European, you know, incrementalism, uh, sort of in, uh, very uh, cautious approach uh, uh, that. Um, uh, Biden is really trying to address both domestic and foreign policy, linking them uh, to uh, uh, the common man. Uh, you know, Obama, uh, President Obama was not audacious, um, was extremely cautious. And, uh, you know, his approach, uh, you know, Obama, Trump and Biden, all three of them certainly understood that America would uh, would face challenges and uh, and all three of them completely different uh, personalities uh, all of uh, all approached uh, what to do with this uh, not declining US um, uh, power just more competitiveness and um, uh, so the Europeans are thinking well you know Trump is is interesting he he shattered uh, he shattered something that perhaps needed to be shattered, which is the Europeans have to be uh, less dependent on the Americans. Uh, there is uh, China, uh, which people, which the Europeans see as a, a rising power. And also what Trump did was basically tell the Europeans that you can't rely on the Americans anymore. Mm. Um, and, I think, and, and I think that is, you know, if we were to do another show on what Trumpism is, because everyone uh, concentrates uh, on personality, which is the wrong thing to to to, um, uh, to concentrate on. Uh, it's, yeah, I'll, it's, it's, I'll, it's the I'll take that as a note, although that yeah, would uh, yeah, not so, be as pleasant as the subject of this show. <laughs> but you know, I think I that's a very good suggestion as yeah, to, like, so to there, take a look so at the, the lingering effects of, of Trump. So the Europeans are saying the Americans aren't trustworthy, and they're linking that to domestic politics. Right, let me, let me. Yeah, I'm sorry to talk so much, but the Europeans. It's okay. No, Paul, I appreciate the feedback on yeah, that. Very the Europeans see American domestic policy as uh, domestic uh, challenges, as um, not systemic racism, but uh, uh, systemic failures. All right. Let's so talk about systemic racism in another. Uh, in another um, uh, podcast, but, uh, yeah. So that's uh, so uh, very interesting, uh, Stephen. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a nice pause. Yeah, we don't have Trump uh, right in front of us anymore. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, things things have changed fundamentally. Um, All right. So, Jerry, <clears throat> as before the show started, uh, you and I were chatting briefly that Prime Minister Suga was uh, just in the United States, and he's the first foreign leader to have a chance to visit the new president in the White House. I ask you the same question I asked Paul from, from your perspective as a long-term resident of Japan. Also, you're affiliated with the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan, former vice president, <coughs> former governor of the Kansai region. What do you think? Uh, what's your perspective on this? Is, is uh, Japan also experiencing this relief from the Trump administration? Or may, <clears throat> maybe that's not so pronounced here. Or what do you think the general yeah. perception is of, of how Biden is doing in the first three months? Right. Well, you know, uh, thank, first of all, thank you uh, very much, uh, Steve. Very happy uh, to be on the show. I, I think you're correct that relief is one of the major emotions that, that people are, are feeling right now, you know, given sort of the unpredictability and, and chaos uh, that was a kind of a hallmark of, of the previous administration. Um, you know, as far as you know, his, his performance, it is still a, a little bit of a, a, a wait and see, I do believe. I mean, th things have gotten off to a good start. I mean, you had uh, Secretary of State Blinken, you know, who was, who was here uh, in Japan last month. Again, the first foreign leader, as you mentioned, for Biden to meet uh, is uh, Prime Minister Suga, which uh, again shows uh, you know, the strength of the U.S.-Japan relationship and the respect that the, the two countries have for one another. Um, it, it, as, you know, I, I think in addition to relief, it's just a return to predictability and stability that I think a lot of people appreciate uh, here in Japan and I think in, in, in Asia in general. One thing that may be a little bit different uh, from the you know, European perspective, uh, and you know, I, again, I say this as someone who's a, a joint citizen, I'm a Czech as well as an American, so I, I, I hear quite, oh, quite, a, quite, quite a bit from, from uh, uh, you know, both sides on this. But, you know, here in Japan, uh, as we know, Vice Pre well, it was Vice President Biden was Vice President to President Obama. President Obama's policy in in East Asia toward Japan, particularly as you know, vis-a-vis -vis China, was seen with a, with a bit of skepticism here uh, in Japan, uh, particularly because of the you know advancements as far as you know the the uh, encroachment. Of China militaristically, you know, into the you know South China Sea and, and in other areas. So, look, I think that that you know President uh, Biden is very well known here in Japan. He has a lot of connections here. But you know, it, it, it is it is sort of a wait and see, particularly how the Biden administration is going to handle thorny issues such as China uh, and and other things going forward. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be interesting to see when he makes his first uh, Asia trip. And also, Paul, whether he comes to Asia before Europe or maybe he visits Europe first. I think yeah, historically. He's hosting, uh, he's hosting uh, actually on the 22nd of this month uh, on Earth Day. He's, uh, he's hosting a climate uh, summit. Oh, uh, I see. And uh, that's, um, we will see, uh, uh, you know, there was great uh, joy uh, when. Uh, when uh, Biden, you know, rejoined uh, or announced, uh, you know, to rejoin, uh, you know, the Paris uh, Accords, uh, but um, it's uh, the U.S. and China, the world's great, uh, two biggest polluters, um, will have to cooperate uh, on these matters. And there's been there's been degrees of of of, um, of cooperation. Um, and. And I heard uh, President Biden, you know, talk about, uh, you know, climate change as an existential threat. And, um, you know, I'm not, uh, that's, uh, maybe that's another program as well. Um, uh, <laughs> Paul, you've become my program manager. No, 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 it's, 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 the, it's how things are framed. Yes. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, uh, you know, framing, uh, Framing it as an existential threat uh, in uh, when we're not even out of a of a pandemic uh, is is and how what what policy especially at the economic level uh, yeah. for carbon emissions and uh, and how much money is going to be spent on this um, will be uh, will be interesting. So um, 
So uh, we'll see how the uh, how Mr. Biden can can lead uh, you know uh, uh, these thorny issues, especially uh, involving uh, the United States, China, and India uh, as as rising polluters um, and carbon emission uh, emission. Right. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. So for our for our listeners, uh, uh, one thing that's been a distraction, at least on this topic, um, and maybe Jerry, you'll agree with me, is that the uh, <clears throat> we have the fourth wave going here in Japan with the mm-hmm. pandemic, uh, and especially where we live in Kansai now, the Osaka prefecture and uh, also right. Hyogo prefecture. So uh, I think to some extent that's crowded uh, the Biden activity off the front pages and so forth. So a little bit consumed with domestic issues in terms of trying to manage this pandemic, which that could be another show, guys, is Japan's poor response to um, the whole pandemic and the fact that uh, it's now 50% of of people, Americans, are now vaccinated, at least the first shot, and I think it's less than 1% still here in Japan. But anyway, let's go back to uh, the topic for the show, and that is, uh, Paul kind of addressed this already, some of the accomplishments of the Biden administration through the first 90 days. I think the the biggest thing Paul mentioned is uh, the $1.9 trillion relief bill that was passed through and the funding from the government directly to American citizens to try and uh, get the economy to recover from the, the pandemic. And then also this proposed new bill uh, that's uh, roughly $3 trillion to try and uh, reinvigorate the infrastructure and accomplish a whole basket full of different things. I think from my perspective, this is one of the amazing things of the Biden administration so far is that he actually has shepherded a major bill through Congress with uh, no support from the Republicans, as we know, and is now planning to do uh, even more government support for the economy, which would include, Paul, to your point, Uh, investments in American energy and uh, ecological issues as well. So let's start with you, Paul, again, and and, uh, just very briefly, are you you surprised that all of this is happening so quickly? Uh, Well, I was going to say that, uh, and um, um, you can, uh, I was going to say that, you know, I am shocked, Um, uh, absolutely shocked that uh, Biden becomes the sort of, you know, Tom Brady uh, of politics, you know, drafted 199th. Uh, no one expected, uh, you know, him to, to Brady to be the, perhaps the greatest quarterback in NFL history. And here's Biden, um, who um, becomes sort of the default president at age 78. And in his first 100 days, um, uh, not just with executive orders, uh, which is, again, a Another debatable point, but he has um, he has uh, been to repeat myself audacious, and I think he's uh, we've underestimated either or the, uh, not his, him in his ability. I'm not sure about leading uh, because there are people behind the scenes, obviously, but a raft of uh, legislation, um, a whole different vocabulary, uh, setting America on a different path. Um, uh, some of the wokeism uh, of the extreme left, uh, he's he's managing that, I think. Um, and I'm shaking my head. I think it makes a lot of people uh, uncomfortable here in Europe. Uh, the front page of a major magazine uh, uh, just published a couple of days ago. Uh, 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 I could put it on the screen was, you know, basically uh, talking uh, very, very negative towards the extreme left. Um, and as we know, here in Europe, um, the uh, the right is much more powerful than the left. And there's an election here in France next uh, next year and one in Germany uh, as well. And alternative for Germany and, of course, uh, Marine Le Pen here in France. Uh, the conservatives in England and also in Scandinavia um, uh, and in other countries in Europe, not all, um, uh, that the right is resonating much more than the left. Mm-hmm. So people are afraid of a, um, or the left is not messaging 
uh, effectively. Um, and um, so I saw that front page magazine article of uh, we don't want to go the way the Americans are going with the left, hmm. the extreme left, excuse me. And that's, um, yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, point. It's a, it's a very, it's a very tough, uh, um, you know, uh, let's not make the U.S. California, we could say. Um, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Jerry, no, Jerry no. that reminds me of some conversations we've had over the last couple of years yeah. as well. Right. Yeah, I, I think uh, the progressive wing or group of the Democratic Party is, is just frankly surprised at the direction that Biden, who ran as a moderate primarily, has taken uh, since he became president. It's, it's uh, quite remarkable. Hey, we, we do have a question. Maybe I'll address this to you, Jerry, although I'd like to get uh, your response also or your impressions over the first 90 days and, and what Biden has been able to accomplish. But the question from one of our viewers is, does Japan and Paris respect Biden as much as they respected Obama? So why don't I start with you, Jerry? Do you, do you think uh, the Japan public opinion is very positive about Biden as it was? Uh, well, I, I, again, I still think we're in the wait and see. And, and again, I wouldn't overestimate the love for Obama uh, in, in Japan and Asia. Uh, I, again, I think we also have to remember that President Obama followed George W. Bush, who, if you were doing a contest for the worst post-war president, <laughs> you know, <laughs> is, is thankful that, that Donald Trump was elected because if, if, if you know, uh, so look, that, that said, I think I think people in Japan appreciated and liked Obama again because he was he was better than George W. Bush. But uh, President Obama's policies. And again, I say this, I was actively involved in the in the Obama campaign, so I'm a huge Obama supporter. But uh, but by the same token, there were people who were critical of, you know, uh, Obama's, uh, President Obama's policies here in Japan, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Mm, okay, interesting. So to answer the question, Biden has to, uh, you know, live up to and exceed, exceed that. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. We're, we're still in that mode. Okay. Paul, you have any comments about that? Uh about yeah, it, you know, Obama was uh, was the rock star. Um, and, this is from a European uh, perspective. His, well, you know, his his um, his whole story um, uh, was uh, of myth uh, and uh, heroic myth, if you like. And um, I think he underperformed. Um, and maybe that is, uh, with all respect to lawyers. Uh, that was his uh, his training. No, no, I'm I'm, I'm very serious. In respect. Uh oh, hey, very, hey, no. very balanced hey. and trying to uh, see both sides. <laughs> hey, Paul, I have I have a rule. Uh, he on was my also show. a professor. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, guys, I have a rule on my show: no fighting among the guests, lawyers yeah, versus and, professors. And, you know, <laughs> you know, his, his nickname was you know no drama Obama, and uh, but uh, he um, he was very cautious. And um, um, that uh, his, you know, I didn't work uh, in the Obama administration, so um, uh, hmm. so he was he was very very cautious. And uh, back to the uh, um, very cautious cautious as far as China, not confrontational. Um, Mr. Trump, of course, uh, the master of uh, the great disruptor in many ways, and he thought that was by disrupting and then doing sort of transactional. Uh, negotiations, if you like, of uh, dividing and conquer and having advantage um, uh, at an individual level. He thought, um, Mr. Trump thought that was the way um, to lead. And exactly as um, exactly as as you said, this has resulted in chaos. So, um, Mr. Mr. Biden is grandfatherly and calm and uh, controlled and. Um, uh, he's gonna, but I also feel that you know, I have to be very cautious with Biden because he has to, he's not leading through the power of speech and through rhetoric. And that's what Obama did. Uh, uh, his speech writers um, were brilliant, Obama's, and he could speak like Ronald Reagan, just mm -hmm. not like Ronald Reagan, but in, in, a, in a theatrical way, uh, just brilliant. 
and uh, oh, uh, no one's expecting that from from Biden. And, and, yeah, and he and seems to be keeping a much lower profile than uh, certainly Obama did, or or yeah. certainly Trump. Trump was in the news every single day. I mean, we all went through Trump fatigue. So we just have a, a couple minutes left, guys. I I know we don't have enough time to address this, but uh, look into the crystal ball. Uh, it, we're we're seeing economists, even Republicans now, are forecasting an economic boom in Japan. So. Uh, what do you think is going to transpire over the next couple of years? Maybe if you could just give me a one-minute response. Are we, are we looking at a very successful presidency here based on the first 90 days and how things may play out over the next year? So there's always un, unknowns. But what do you think? What, what's your forecast? Just briefly, uh, let me start with you, Jerry. What would you say? 30 seconds. Tell me what's going to happen over the next uh, three and a half years or so. <clears throat> I, I think uh, that, that President Biden is going to focus on pandemic, which I think is actually his greatest accomplishment to, to hopefully uh, get us out of that. I think infrastructure is going to be next. Uh, I, I do believe that he does have an opportunity to be a very uh, successful president. Uh, again, stability, uh, predictability, both, you know, especially internationally. I, I think he, he's going to have an, a, you know, a, the ability to rehabilitate the uh, the image of the United States. We'll see domestically. I think he's going to have a number of challenges domestically, and we will just really have to see how those happen. And again, I, as, as Professor Scott said, we may have a different president, but not a different country. Paul, any last words? We just have about half a minute left. Well, the half a minute is um, there is the list of, of, put, of, of uh, crises that uh, Mr. Biden has to has to uh, deal with both um, at the at the foreign relations level, China and North Korea, yeah, um, uh, at the top of the list, but also uh, with uh, back to Europe, uh, what to do with Russia, um, and Russia and energy and energy energy scarcity as a as a conflict point um, is something that uh, is on the, the minds of all Europeans because there are many countries in Europe that are hundred percent dependent. On Russian, uh, on Russian uh, energy. Um, so uh, how Russia yeah. <laughs> deals with uh, whether it wants to be complementary in this system, um, and whether China wants to be complementary is um, uh, with with the United States. I think uh, both the Europeans and the, the the Chinese have to be very very careful about underestimating American power. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, the time has just flown by, as I knew it would with the two of you. Really appreciate you taking time out to, for you very late at nightfall and for Jiri for us in Japan a, a little bit early in the morning. Really enjoy talking to you, and I hope our viewers and uh, uh, those of you that take a look at this recording later on enjoy this show. I'll be on again in two weeks, and I'm going to look at venture capital in Japan. That'll be the topic for looking to the East. So again, thank you, Paul and Jiri, so much for participating today. And to my viewers, I'll see you guys all in a couple of weeks or so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Okay.